This is Third Paradigm, and I'm Teresa Caraggio. Last episode, I gave you my lush garden as a background. Today, I'm giving you the Great Reset Austerity background. It's up to us, people. This is our choice. My topic in this episode is Noam Chomsky is the problem. And for those of you old enough to get the R2-D2 reference, warning, warning, Will Robinson, rant ahead. Even though Noam Chomsky is a liberal icon and a personal hero, I think it's time to critically look at what his ideology is and measure it by the yardstick of my personal dogma that I've been talking about. And then decide, is it time to honor the place that he's brought us to, which I definitely appreciate, and is it time to move on from that? Because we need to get this right. Let's get started. The impetus for this is an interview that Russell Brand did with Noam Chomsky on his Under the Skin podcast. As I've often said, I have one dogma, and my one dogma is that I am not better than anyone else. By better, I mean morally superior. So I want to apply that yardstick to Noam and look at three different areas from the talk that he had with Russell. First is the moral superiority of a needs-based economy. Second is the moral superiority of young people as activists and particularly in the environmental movement. And then third, the inherent moral superiority of infants and whether the educational system is something that trains that out of them. And then I want to end with a comment that Russell makes where he says, well, we can chew gum and walk at the same time. We can treat the symptoms and also at the same time cure the disease. We can change the system while we're doing little fixes to make things better for people. I want to question that. So let's start. The first question that Russell asks is lobbing a softball. And he says, how did you become who you are? This magnificent person who has dedicated his life to speaking the truth. And what Noam says is, that's the wrong question. The right question is, why isn't everyone like this? Because if you pass a person who's suffering, of course you should want to alleviate their suffering. You should want to take people out of misery. So why isn't everyone just like I am? So let me start by saying that Noam himself is not a farmer. He's not a doctor. He's not a carpenter. So when people need food or health care or shelter, he's not the one who's actually providing it. What he's providing is money that takes those products of someone else's labor and gives those to the person who's in need rather than the person who actually is doing the work owning the product of their labor. So you start out with this mentality, which to be honest, it's a slave owner mentality. It's like that kid whose parents are slave owners in the Bahamas, but they live in London and they think that this is just normal, that they have all of this largesse to spread around because they don't see what's actually backing the money that they have. So Noam isn't just talking about giving his own money, of course. He's talking about a socialized system in which we all are therefore giving our money i.e. other people's labor to those who are in need on the basis of their needs. I don't think that works. I think we need a system of reciprocity because if we respond to a system of need, all you end up doing is creating more needs and pulling that from the people who are trying to create reciprocity within the community because you're never going to touch those people who are enacting greed, who are part of 
the extractive process from the rest of us. All you're doing is pulling that down from the people so that more people are falling from being able to take responsibility for themselves and for each other and instead making them part of that mass who are in need and who have needs far too expensive for anyone to be able to fulfill them. Russell asks Noam, where do you see hope? And Noam's answer is in young people. They are such activists. They're much more active than we were. And the things that they're doing are magnificent. And of course, he mentions Greta Thunberg talking in front of Davos. And I think that anyone who thinks young people are going to save us does not live between a middle school and a high school, as I do, surrounded by college students. Leaving that aside, let's look at Greta and all of these students that they're living still with their parents, taking responsibility for providing everything to them that they have, that they are complaining about. And Greta, I remember reading her shaming her parents into giving up their travel, which their jobs required, and particularly her mother. That takes a lot of nerve for a kid who is financially dependent. Let's also look at the activist side of that. In a recent interview, Matt Arrett quoted Sun Yat-sen, the first president of China, who said, learning is hard, action is easy. And honestly, that brought tears to my eyes because I am so frustrated with the ADHD attitude towards learning, especially with young people. It's Okay, tell me about the problem in five minutes and make it snappy and then tell me what I can do about it. Where is a button I can push? Where is something that I can send off into the ether? And that drives me nuts because you have to understand the problem. If you don't understand the problem, you are going to be manipulated. And naive do-gooders, or NDGs as I call them, they are more <sighs> necessary to the system than anyone who is doing evil. That if you have the people who are actually plotting these things, it's one in a hundred million people. So the other 999999999 of us are going along with it. We are being duped and we're reinforcing that with our acquiescence and especially when we're giving it virtue points. So we've got to get over the ability to be emotionally manipulated and we need to do that by actually using reason and logic and facts. And that's not something you can do in a soundbite. To segue briefly into the climate change debate and the fact that, oh, isn't Davos lovely? They're listening to Greta. I've been researching since I read on Caitlin Johnstone's blog that the U.S. only has 11 years left of proven oil reserves. And I was wondering, where's that going? So what I found out in an article in the Atlantic is that since December, the oil tankers that were actually supposed to go to Japan and South Africa and all these other countries stopped mid-ocean and all headed towards Europe because as the Society for American Oil or something like that, that's really the oil lobbyist group says, Europe, we've got your back. So what that means is that the oil that they're telling us we can't have anymore, that we need to go to all electric cars, that they're going to phase out gas stoves and they're going to phase out all of these different things because we don't deserve that last remains of oil. That's going to Europe because Europe is paying a higher price 
than these other places. So the fracking that we are endangering our water supplies with is not even for our benefit. Think about that. Russell then asked Nome, well, is selfishness human nature? Is that just part of our genetic makeup? And Nome says that when people say that, it's just wish fulfillment. I think he means it's just an excuse. And that if you look at an infant, that one of the first concepts they ever get is that's not fair. And that even a two-year-old understands that concept of justice. As a mother of three, I can tell you that whenever a two-year-old uses that phrase, they're talking about themselves. They're talking about, this is not fair to me. They're not saying, oh, you know, mom, I don't think this is fair to you. I don't think I'm being fair to you. You know, I don't think this is really fair to my sister. They're always talking about them. And learning how to share is the most important lesson we ever learn. I am grateful every day to my daycare provider who taught all my kids how to share that concept that you are the most important person in the world and so is everyone else. So I think that Gnome is looking at that as a way of mm, fetishizing children and youth and looking at them being the ones who are going to solve the problem rather than understanding what the problem is without doing the easy thing of shifting the blame. And then Noam talks about the educational system and how all of his students really have one purpose, which is to get a job. And that that kind of wage slavery was something that used to be something that we were clear was not what we wanted, that that was a form of servitude. I agree with all of those things, but I think you have to look at the contradiction that this is what gives Noam his security to be able to speak the truth, that he has been a tenured professor for his entire career. So if the educational system is something that is training out that ability to think morally, and I agree with that, you can't just bite the hand that feeds you and not acknowledge that this is a way that you've been able to separate yourself from the need to make a living in the way that other people do. And I'll end by looking at Russell's assertion that we can have both, that we can respond to people's needs at the same time that we're trying to change the system. I don't think that's possible. When I look at our government, we have a government that is being forced to work as if it's a for-profit business, that our governments have to sell off our labor and our resources because they don't have any other means of organizing our own labor and resources. They are dependent on the bankers who are the ones who create the money. And that cabal of, in the United States, the Federal Reserve, internationally, the BIS, that that's what actually has the function, has usurped the function of government. Because they create the money, they organize labor according to their whims, which is in order to make more money and have more power. So we have to change that. But what's tricking us into not changing it is this idea that our priority is to give people whatever they need without any system of reciprocity. If we do that, that will suck up every last dime that we get. I've been thinking that it's a good thing that the system that I'm talking about, where we take the power to create mortgages back from the bankers and give it to the communities, it's a good thing that that isn't working right now because if it was, it would just end up being another benefit that gets given away to whoever has the greatest needs and it wouldn't have the power of creating productive economies within our community. 
So I think that we have to get to a point where that ideology and every level of government ends up being thoroughly discredited by whatever the consequences are going to be of us having gone along with it for this long before we can say, no, that didn't work. We have to make sure that we can't be fooled again. I think I can only follow this up with a couple of other rants. And so this one is on Kehinde Andrews and Candace Owens called Wokeness Versus the Void. And then this one is on manufacturing contempt, something I think we have to be careful that we're not doing. Thank you for being part of my community. And please check this out also on Substack, where it will have links.